and welcome to another episode of Artists of the Night. Um, today, I have the great fortune of being joined by Sharon Carvel. Uh, Sharon has a lifetime of art uh, that she that she has been creating and is continuing to create. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to this conversation uh, where we're going to talk about her work, uh, her experience, and uh, maybe get some advice from her. Sharon, how are you today? I'm fantastic. How are you, darling? I am fantastic. It's uh, wonderful to be talking to you. Pretty good to talk to you. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so um, we'll go ahead and start this. Uh, start with a with a kind of a, a great question here. Um, what got you into art initially? When you, when I did was you born when, that way? You were born that way. <laughs> <laughs> um, did did you were you did you draw as a child or? Yes, actually, my first award was in the third grade, and uh, I won second in the city. Believe it or not, way back then, for a poster on environment. And, and um, so I won, I came in second and I won an airplane ride. And it was oh, you did? My, first, my first airplane ride. Where where did you go? Uh, up in the air. <laughs> <laughs> up in the air. <laughs> <laughs> I, <guess. laughs> I walked right into that one. <laughs> oh, that's that's excellent. Um, so did you? I thought so. Um, so did you study art in school as well? Has it was it kind of a, a hobby, or was it just was it a calling for you right off the bat? Right off the bat, it was a calling. So, yes, in my teachers were marvelous i had i had two teachers in high school mrs stevens and mrs zimmerman and i was a spoiled brat that's true i was i guess i was good okay <laughs> i'm not surprised <laughs> i'm good so did you uh did you end up going to, to formal did you get formal training then beyond school did you go to did you go to college for art oh i went to france okay I you went to france was, yes i went to france and um well my husband was in i married okay just a major minor thing there and my husband was in the air force and we were stationed just outside of paris so I got to study for four years in France with uh, different teachers. What was wonderful, oh God, uh, what was wonderful was uh, you could take your sketch pad into the Louvre and you could, you know, just sketch whatever you wanted and be there. And it was, it was, it was a marvelous place to study and to see um when i first saw michelangelo's david it was it was amazing and so and i i have never been able i loved van gogh but i've never been able to capture his colors which blew me away they were magnificent so yes that's a fantastic uh, education for sure i mean being being uh, in paris and exposed to you know the masterworks and the, the people who, you know, have created these these monumental pieces of artwork. I loved it. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so you you mentioned drawing. Is that how you started? Because I, you know, I you, you do move through a, a variety of mediums, definitely. Yes, yes, it is how I started. Um, probably always drawing. Um, drawing is like second nature to me. It's like breathing. Um, it's a phenomenal way of expressing myself. So, yeah. And then did, would you say drawing then led to painting? Oh, definitely. Mm -hmm. Definitely okay. it did. And then from that period, probably up until about 30 years ago, the most 
you know, is drawing and painting and drawing and painting, which was marvelous. And I was very fortunate. But then uh, about 30 years ago, I began to experiment with sculpting, um, which led me on a totally different path. Can you talk about your sculpting method? Because it is a very, very unique uh, style of sculpting. You betcha. And it took me a while. It took me really 30 years to de develop what I have today. And I started out basically, I was in the design field and we went for an interview to renovate um, the officers club out of the Air Force Academy. And I remember walking in and I looked around and we needed something for the entry. And I thought, you know, we can't put a bronze here. It's too heavy. It would not hold the weight. And those are things I had to know at that time. So, but I thought, what if somebody developed something that was lighter weight that could do exactly what I saw in my mind, but weigh a fraction of a bronze. And that set me on my way to experimenting. And uh, so I began to experiment. And at first I used Kleenex tissues and Kleenex supplied me with all sorts of paper was amazing. They were they were very helpful. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. But then they changed the way they manufactured Kleenex. And it no longer had a warp and a weft. It okay. was all um pulp. So so you couldn't sculpt it. You couldn't do anything with it because it was pulp and it would be pulpy and fall to pieces. So that did not work. So I began to experiment with fiber fabric. And as I began to experiment with it, I discovered that silk was exceedingly uh, malleable. Is that the term I want mm -hmm. for what I was doing? And uh, so I fell in love. And from that point on, it was silk in me. And so now my sculptings are basically all silk and um, they have color in very unique because sculpting with color is a totally different dimension. I had to really get used to it and still am. I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, kind of some of the subject matter uh, that you've Go kind of it. that you've covered in your work. Um, well, one thing I will definitely say in, in my experience, uh, observing and absorbing your artwork, uh, you're not one to shy away from controversial topics. I love them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what, what else have we except the fact that we have to look at each other and controversial subjects are controversial. They may bring the people in and become a part of what I'm trying to express. And I, and I think that, you know, in, in that sense too, you're able to make a very strong statement, you know, because you, you can say something, you can express a verbally express a, an opinion on a controversial topic but then that's just everybody kind of does that but when you see a piece of artwork or you see a particular sculpture that really kind of depicts something that's that's controversial i think it makes a little bit of a different impact on people well and i hope that they're timeless because the subjects that i try to choose are timeless they are things that um, we've been de dealing with for thousands of years and they keep on going so um, I, I, I just want them to be a constant 
on their own. To kind of balance that out too, there's a lot of fun and whimsy in your, in your artwork too. There's a lot of, uh, you know, just, you know, you know, exuberance and, and love for life that, that, that is displayed. You know. I love, I love children and I love life. And I also think that if they can look at my work and communicate with it and feel that, then I have achieved something that is um, what I would like to do. You know, it's, it's what I intended to do was to be able to communicate with them because they are the ones who have tomorrow. Also, it is my prayer for them. Good. Um, so let's go ahead. Do, do you uh, want to take a little time and talk about some of your pieces? Sure. Okay. Um, sure. Well, since we've since we've already started talking about uh, um, your sculpture, let's go ahead and uh, start with uh, Ruth and Naomi. Um, what can you tell um, us about, about this piece? Ruth and Naomi is is. Uh, the story from the Old Testament of two women. And it's really the only story that I know in our literature that portrays the friendship of two women and the loyalty of one woman to the other. And um, to me, it became a significant story which is also, I think, what happened as far as the, the Old Testament is concerned, because it only has four books, and they're small. I mean, she's like a page and a half long, but, but uh, they have, um, how do I want to put it? I think that they have stimulated for thousands of years, the relationship with women. And I think they have been possibly one of the ideals that has been held up and possibly something to try to achieve. I personally don't know the story of Ruth and Naomi. Is there, was there some sort of a conflict involved? Is Honey, there... I have a really, really hard time. The reason I have a really, I told Debbie this morning, Every time I read that story, and I just read it again to refresh my memory, I keep thinking she is, um, Naomi is the older woman, and she ends up by teaching Ruth, but they travel across the desert um, to go to a new place to live. And I had to imagine what they would need to make that trip. Um, and how they would go because they went on foot, but um, this is four or five or six thousand years ago. So I don't I don't know how long ago it would have been, but it it was a very interesting period of time to study what were the colors, what were you know what were they wearing. Um, I, I respected both of the women, so I wanted whatever my portrayal was to be real for them and for me and for everybody. And so what happened was Naomi guided Ruth in how it took place over a 10 year period actually how to seduce a man okay it's just <laughs> that's that's what it really came down to and um so ruth ends up by eventually marrying boaz who is the man that she and but what it does is it shows what life was like at that, that particular period of time in a very um there there no preaching there's there's nothing. There's just she got up. She she gleaned the corn. She, you know, she slept uh, on the ground. It was it was very very 
primal and really that's all there is in that book is just that story of what life was like at that time other than the fact that Naomi was um, Ruth's mentor and um, guided her toward how to survive while gleaning the corn. <laughs> okay, so that's it. Well, and that's, uh, yeah, and I would imagine that, you know, it, at that time too, making a long journey across the desert, I mean, that, that wouldn't be easy now, but, it, you know, so I would imagine back then, you know, just, it would be quite the struggle and quite the quite the journey oh, well, and, and, and hard. Because there were lions and tigers and all this thing. And and two women taking taking off like that uh, alone. So possibly they were maybe my first two heroines mm -hmm. that I looked up to from the time that I was a little girl. And so I had to capture that. Tell, tell us a little bit about scapegoats. Ah, Simone. Um, scapegoats. Flora, fauna. Flora and fauna. Okay. Those are two very significant things in our life. However, when you look at it, the snake is a bad person. The woman is evil. And the flora is messed up. So, <laughs> yeah, it, all three of them are scapegoats. They got the bad rap for what? Um, you know, ever since then, we have had less respect for anyone or not even ourselves and um you know the the snake is spooky and bad and will kill you which it will and it has that right um you know the tree what good is it um you know it gets in our way get it out of the way so we can build um you know it, it's it's um, and the woman, need I say more? A long, long time to be even able to vote, honey. So, <laughs> so well, we've been suffering that burden for a long, long time. And, it, and in the particular story that that's referencing, right, then this is where the woman has ca caused us to be cast out of paradise, right? Yeah, we bad people, honey. So, you know, somebody has to take the blame and we got it. And I think it's taken us, what, what? Oh, the apple, I forgot about the apple. Don't eat the apple. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you do, the, the apple Whatever of knowledge. Whatever you, you don't... do, don't eat the apple. Okay, it will give you wisdom. <laughs> and what happens then? So, you know, all three are scapegoats. They're, they're just something to blame it on. And unfortunately, I think it shows our ignorance and our lack of respect for what we really depend upon. And I'm sorry about that. Yeah, and I think it also probably transfers responsibility, it takes responsibility off of certain people and puts it or on, you know, puts it into certain. Well, that's what scapegoats do, you know, <laughs> they they get blamed for it, so nobody else has to. So, uh, yeah, and it's sad. It's sad. Um, I have often wondered. Someone says, "Well, they're in a better place," and. My grandson said to me, if they're in a better place, why do we take care of what's here? And I think he was 12 years old when he asked me that question. And it's a good question. It's a great question. What is a better place? 
And why do we say people are going to it? And why do we, you know, why don't we take care of what we have? And um, it, it's, it's something that I think we need to think about and, and understand that this is it and it is now. And it's beautiful. Uh, we are fortunate. There are people in this world who do not have what we have. And we are so fortunate to be where we are. And so I think we're in one of the best places that we could possibly be. And I don't know what I've done to be here, but I'm here and I love it. So I, I have no idea except that I don't think we should hold things out for people and say we're going to a better place make it good here uh walking the baby oh guns um I really believe in this country that guns are more important than even our children because we use them to kill them. Um, I don't know what the love affair in this country is with guns. I, I, I don't have any answers for that. But I only know that they seem to be more important than even our children. And so this particular piece is the Statue of Liberty walking a baby carriage with um what is that 315 or three what an ar-15 in the in the in the carriage and so it's the statue of liberty walking walking baby which is the ar-15 and um that's it that yeah. i mean what more can i say about it it's just what it is it's yeah. it's what you know uh, no it really makes the point too it really does make the point where this what is in the carriage is what's being cared for right and not not what you would normally find in the carriage no no so walking baby is in process and do you do you want to talk about that a little bit like what what so because we're going to be looking at this and the viewers are going to be looking at this, um, this piece in its current state. Um, can you maybe visual, give us a little bit of a visualization of where it's going to, where you think it's going to go or, or is that something you don't know where it's going to go? So it's kind of a journey and you'll, and you'll, it's you'll kind it. of almost finished at this point, except for the final glazes and maybe a little bit more sculpting. Um, I want it to be exactly where it is. Now, sometimes, Sometimes, sometimes I have sculpted and it's brought me to my knees in, in pain of what I was feeling. And um, this piece is more angry, I think. I think really what I feel when I'm working on it is probably anger. Um, mainly because I do not understand. I do not understand our love affair with the gun um, to the point that our children really don't seem to count. And um, I, I, I don't know what the remedy is for that. I don't know. I don't know how you change that unless people really want to change it unless they look at it and say yeah maybe our kids are more important maybe this owning a gun is not the wonderful thing that we think it is it's just have it or whatever i have no idea but all i have to say is that um until we put our children and our lives and our loved ones ahead of this affair that we are having. Um, 
we're just going to continue to do what we're doing, which is shooting each other up and our children, which is the one thing that shows you that we don't really care about our children because we don't seem to change even when we kill them. And so I don't understand. If we have uh, someone who is who is just getting started in, in their art career that's watching this program or somebody who maybe has made art and has stopped and is interested in getting back into it or someone that is, uh, or, you know, someone that's maybe in high school or a little older going into college that's, that's uh, considering that they want to take their inspiration and their arts uh, forward with them through their lives and pursue it. Um, do you have any, what would you, do you have any advice that you'd like to give them? Art is in everything. Living your life is an art. Um, many of us do not have the privilege to live our life as an art. But I would say, how do I want to put this? If it is in you, do it. If you are driven to do it, do it. Now, I have to say there's, you know, um, there's not a great deal of reciprocation. Okay. Um, it's, a, it's, it's particularly as, as an artist like me, you're alone a lot. You, you know, you're in your own head, which could be a problem. But anyway, um, if it is within you, don't give up. And oftentimes things happen to you, like me ending up studying art in France because I got married and ended up there, but not because I went there on purpose, because I couldn't, but I got there. So sometimes things come to you and you don't know that it's really what you wanted in the first place. And you just write it out and keep on going. And that's the only thing I have to say. If you want it, do it and don't stop. <laughs> that's it. And that's, that's, and that's, <laughs> and that's pretty, yeah, no, that's pretty much it, right? I mean, that's, yeah. It's, it's not, it's not something to, to agonize over and just, you know. No, I, you know, it's very simple. It, you can spend your life paying for doing your art. Believe me, I've done that, okay? It's more important to do the art than anything else. So when you get to that point where, you know, that's your supporting it, because you have to, then you know you're there. Mm -hmm. You're just there. You may never leave. <laughs> you may not even want to you're there and it's beautiful hard awesome. that's that's beautiful. that's very that's very inspiring <laughs> oh goody goody <laughs> <laughs> all right well um i do, do you have anything else that you would like to, to add before before we close close the interview yes i want to thank you for all you have done and all you are doing and i'm very pleased to have you in our lives so thank you thank you and the absolutely the feeling is mutual uh Carville. i've i've uh been fortunate i mean when you when you and uh, debbie approached me and, and wanted to come and show work and at the art center i was like yeah sure i'll take a look and then i think i am a fan i'm a huge fan of your work <laughs> yeah. um i really am I, I love i love just everything that you do and uh i love your approach i love your uh tenacity i love your uh <clears throat> your innovation your spirit and just going out and uh i love that you don't mince words and you're not afraid to say what you mean and mean what you say i think that's all super admirable and super valuable so thank you welcome darling go forth and multiply <laughs> All right. And I well, don't mean babies, okay? <laughs> All right. Well, and uh, for those of you that are watching this uh, this 
interview and this uh, this program. Um, thank you very much for um, spending time with us and uh, uh, getting to know a little bit about uh, Sharon Carvel. And uh, we will see you all the next time. Thank you. And that is a cut. Is that a cut, honey? Can That's a cut. Can, yeah. we, nope. can we go on now? <laughs> yeah, we're done. We're done. That's it. That's it. <laughs>